Good evening. Can you hear me? Thank you very much today for your introduction. Uh, thank you all, uh, Brian, Travis, uh, Kyle, and the entire staff of the Anselm House for the honor that you have given me this invitation to be here and deliver the 24th annual Homer Lecture. I'm extremely, extremely grateful and happy to be here to do that. Uh, thank you all for coming out this evening, this beautiful uh, evening uh, for this lecture. Uh, it's good to see some faces I can recognize in the audience, but also it's good to meet new friends. So I'm extremely happy to be here. I have also to bring you greetings, greetings from the fighting Irish, <laughs> and to congratulate you all for the impre very impressive, in a way, show that the golden golfers are carrying on. Say, go, <laughs> golfers. <laughs> yeah. So we're rooting for you. And uh, So uh, what I want to do uh, this evening, really, is to reflect on this topic of resisting violence and seeking a path toward reconciliation. What does that look like, especially 25 years after the genocide? It has been 25 years, 1994 genocide. In a very, very short time, over 800,000 people killed in this beautiful country of Rwanda. It's not only the speed of the genocide that is amazing in 100 days, the effectiveness of the genocide. It's also the intimacy of that killing neighbors, killing neighbors, people they know at a very close range using machetes and this is very, very intimate. But also from a Christian point of view, that this has happened in a predominantly Christian country with over 85% of the population Christians. So 1994, April 1994, Easter week. The genocide happened during the Easter week, started during the Easter week when Christians all over the world are celebrating new life. Here in Rwanda, 1994, the genocide is happening. Many times in the same churches that Christians had gone to celebrate Resurrection Easter. What is going on? How do you even explain that, that the churches become killing Fields in 1994. Like this is the ruined church of Nyange in the Kiwiye prefecture. In this church, over 2,000 people were killed. This church, this used to be a church, now it's all a graveyard. But what happened there as people took refuge in the church? The priest conspired with the militias to bring bulldozers and bulldoze the whole church on the ground that now has turned into a cemetery. Over 2,000 people killed. How do you make even that thinkable? How do you even explain that? Well, in my previous work, I've done a lot of that attempt to try to account, try to explain, try to make sense of how an event like this could be thinkable. I'm not going to do that this evening. Because this evening, I'm interested in telling a set of stories that are connected to two places. One, a high school. The other, a church. And I do so tell these stories for two reasons, interrelated reasons. One, 
Because I'm interested in those communities and individuals that resisted genocide, that resisted violence. Those who in the midst of this madness were willing and had the courage to say no, no to violence, no to genocide. What made that possible? How to resist violence? And what lessons can we draw from that? That's the first reason. The other reason why I want to tell this set of story is that I'm interested in the whole topic of the healing of memory. It has been 25 years since genocide. For survivors, is it possible to heal from such a traumatic event? What does it take to heal? What does healing look like in the context of such atrocity? And you know, in Rwanda, the genocide is connected to issue of identity. Hutus killing Tutsis. Since the genocide and the violence was connected to issue of an ident identity, what does it mean to heal in relation to identity? Can identities be healed? Can identities be reconciled? What does that look like? That's what I want to do uh, this evening. Tell a set of stories that are connected to these two places, Nyange, a secondary school, Ruhango, a parish. And as I share the stories that are connected to these two places, I want to highlight some of the interconnectedness between resisting violence on the one hand and healing from the wounds of violence. Two places. In trying to understand why genocide did not happen in these two places that we are going to talk about, a high school and a parish, in trying to understand why, I have identified three elements why the genocide did not happen in this place. One, a sense of family. Two, a sense of providence. And three, a sense and experience of healing. So three items, three things, three themes I want to be teasing out in these stories. An experience of a sense of family, a new family, if you like. Two, the gift of providence that many people call miracle. And three, the dynamics of healing that you see going on in all the three, the, the two places. So we begin with Nyange High School. This is Nyange High School that is actually across the road from the church where the genocide happened. Across the road is this high school. In 1997, three years after the genocide, militia who are still perpetuating the genocide attacked the school in the evening. And they told the students to separate Hutu on one side and Tusi on the other. The students remained in their seats, they didn't move. The second time the order was given, the student didn't move. The head of the militia went and picked one student, one student and shot her at close range, hoping that that would scare the students to follow the order. The students refused. Then he gave orders to start shooting. And so they started shooting and the students were hiding under their desks. You know, eight students were killed and many sustained injuries. Father Jean-Baptiste Mvukihehi was one of the students in high school that time. I asked him, it's a long story how I connected with him, but I asked him to recount what happened 
1997. And so he explained the whole evening, um, how they had just finished their preparation. They are uh, going for their um, last revision before going to bed, and then the militia attacked. But even more than that, I was interested to know from him, why did he think the students refused to separate? What was going on? How could he account for the fact that all the students said no? And his explanation goes like this. I think it's a simple fact that since our being together, and I quote, in the beginning of the school, we were like a family. I do not remember the school authorities ever teaching us that you are one family, but we were just like a family. Hutu or Tusi or together, we were just like a family. And I kind of pressed him and said, what does that mean? What do you think happened? What made this sense of family so strong? And he goes on to explain the different activities that they did together. Ours was a small school, no more than 300 or 400 students, meaning that you knew everybody. And seniors were in charge of the junior students. And so he kept coming back. It was like a small family, the solidarity, the interconnectedness between the students. It was like a small family family. That's the first element I want to point out. So, but as I kept uh, pressing him, but where did the student get the courage? He eventually then admits, you know, we ourselves were surprised by the courage. We did not know that we had that kind of courage. The heroism surprised us, but now, we have to work to strengthen those values and principles. A sense of family, but also a sense of surprise. It's as if it came from outside us. We were surprised. Later on, we are going to talk about that sense of providence. There was something even beyond us. To them, in a way, it was also surprising, a kind of miracle, if you want. That is is Jean Baptiste, who is now a priest, who is involved uh, in the ministry of the healing of memories. I will say more about Jean Baptiste because he's crucial to understanding the dynamics that I'm trying to tease out. He is now connected, deeply connected to a ministry of the healing of memories. But this is where, this is what happened. So Jean-Baptiste is wounded in the attack in Nyange. He goes to the hospital, he's taken to the hospital, and uh, uh, when he was in the hospital recovering, he begins to get a kind of a strange feeling about his life as he's recovering. And he goes and talks to a Marist brother from New Jersey who happened to visit the, the sick in the hospital asking him about the other schools that he could go to once he's out of the hospital. And then he starts to talk about to feeling a sense of wanting to do something more than just going to the university. He did pass very well, got to the, was admitted in the university, but he said there was a different sense that he, he felt that he needed to do something more. I was having this feeling, he describes it, of a kind of call, he says. And I don't know where that came from. Because, he as he describes, my mother really wanted me to go to the university, but I felt that I needed and I wanted something more. So the brother then recommends him if he could join the Marist and said, well, no. And then he said, well, there is another congregation, the Palatines. And as he described the Palatines, Jean-Baptiste says, well, maybe the Palatines. Especially what attracted him to the Palatines, which is an order, a Catholic order that was founded in Rome, was the devotion of the Palatines to the divine mercy. They have a special devotion to the divine mercy. Uh, those who know something about Catholic devotions, the divine mercy is usually kind of a picture like this with Jesus and the sacred heart here. 
and with kind of graces, rays kind of emanating from that. So that is the order in a way that Jean Baptiste joined eventually. And so I asked him, what was it about you joining the Palatines that you found a powerful or significant during your time? What do you remember about your seminary formation? And said, first and foremost, formation for me was a time of purification and a time of healing. For until now, I felt a heavy burden in me. What is the burden, I ask? Of course, I was thinking and remembering all the attacks and the wounds and so forth. But also, I was remembering the pain in my family. My father had been killed, had died, and my, and my mother spent a lot of time on the run trying to survive the genocide. I felt like this heavy burden. And in the formation, he said, I felt like a heavy burden had been taken off me. How did that happen, I press him. I guess it's because of this devotion to the divine mercy. In the story of the divine mercy of God inviting us all into his divine mercy, I felt that even my wounds were getting lighter. That is Jean Baptiste joining the Palatines and the devotion to the divine mercy, providing a sense of healing. Fast forward, now he's a priest, and he's in charge of a shrine in Kabuga that is dedicated to the healing of memories. And he said, this the work that completely connects deeply with me. At the shrine, a number of things happen at this shrine of the divine mercy in Kabuga. Again, divine mercy. But when I took a group of students there, after visiting some of these very, very painful places like churches where the genocide happened, we come to this compound in Kabuga, this shrine, and we are welcomed by Father Jean Baptiste. And then he takes us to the different stations in this shrine including the nativity, the art of crucifixion, and Calvary, kind of depicting Calvary. And below that, there is even a scene, a chapel in the tomb of Jesus, where in that small chapel, there is a room that people bring all these kind of weapons that were used during the genocide, machetes, arrows, and so forth, and place them there by a statue of Jesus lying in the tomb. And also people come to pray there and write notes of whatever is on their hearts. And at the end of the novena, of the prayers and so forth, all those prayers and notes are put together and burnt with incense as a prayer. So this is the ministry that Jean Baptiste is involved in. But I'm Teasing these elements out, one, a sense of family, two, a sense of surprise and providence, but three, also a sense of healing for Jean Baptiste, physical healing as he lay in the hospital, now the healing also of a burden are being lifted, and now he's using that in the ministry of healing others. That is Nyange, all coming out of this story of this particular school. Resisting genocide, sense of family, sense of providence, and sense of healing, physical healing, but also inner spiritual healing on many levels. That is some of other pictures of the same shrine where Father Jean Baptiste is and receives a number of people, groups of people uh, who come um, every first fight of the month, but also on other days uh, to find healing and bring all sorts of memories at this place to find uh, inner, inner healing. Ruhango Parish. This is another place. So there's Nyange, now Ruhango Parish. This is a parish. One of the few parishes in Rwanda in 1994 that resisted genocide is this parish in the south of Kigali, south of Kigali, called Ruhango Parish. 
Ruhango Parish that was also run by the Palotins. Here in 1994, genocide didn't happen for anybody, for those who took, uh, who, who took refuge in the churches. And of course, I'm interested, how come, I ask Jean-Baptiste and others, how come there was no genocide at Ruhango Parish when there are so many other parishes that were genocide? And experience. Why, well, first of all, you have to understand it because of a miracle. And as I explains, then idea is that actually what the miracle they're talking about, and people are talking about the miracle of Ruhango, it's not just one miracle. It's actually a set of miracles that happened at this parish. The first set of miracles was the parish priest there had been suffering from back pain, he had been taken who is a missionary, had been taken back home to Poland for healing. He was not healed. He came back. There was a charismatic mass in the, in the town. He went, and he found himself that he was healed. And out of that, he said, well, he's going to start a ministry of the healing. And therefore, he goes out to the outreach of the sick and begins, in a way, to um, invite the sick to come to the parish. He has a small group of people working with him really taking care of the sick. This is before the genocide. When the genocide happened, this ministry to the sick was already underway. And a number of people said, oh, if we can only go to the parish, that's where all the sick people, all the suffering people are going. And so they came and took refuge in the parish. But the first miracle that he talk about is that Father Stanislas Ubaniak's healing, that's the pastor's name, was itself a miracle. Then there was another miracle, the miracle of divine providence. The miracle of divine providence uh, happened, according to them, is that at first it was okay, then when the genocide int intensified, Hutu and Tusi were all gathering in this parish, they would send out the Hutus to the villages to buy food because the Tusis couldn't go out. Then it became even more difficult for them to go out, even for the Hutus to go out. So everybody remained in the compound. Now, after five days, they ran out of food. And so they didn't know what to do. So mothers were just actually boiling pots of water so that the children could have hope that the food was coming, but they didn't know where the food was going to come from. And so they kept praying, again, adoration, divine master, they kept praying. In the meantime, a trader in town gets an idea and says, "Where well, there are all these people at the parish. I don't know what they are doing. I don't know how they are getting food. So he decides out of his generosity to pack a truck food of food, rice, beans, uh, sugar, to take to the parish. So he comes to the parish, hoots at the gate of the parish, but of course everybody is scared to come out. They, they are not come out because they think that it is the militia that is coming to kill them. Until finally one person says, I'm going out to see what is taking place to open. And he opens and there is this truck food of food. And this happens around three o'clock in the afternoon and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that is when the special prayers to the divine mercy began. The people, of course, understood that this was a miracle through the divine mercy. So that's the second miracle when people talk about the miracle of Ruhango. The first one was the healing of the priest. This second miracle was about the providence in the midst of the genocide that a truck full of food would show up at 3 o'clock exactly. Then the third miracle was a number of times the militia finally came in and made their way to the compound to kill uh, the people. Remember, these are mostly the sick, uh, the refugees. They were gathered around inside this church for prayer and adoration. One of the practices of the divine mercy adoration, devotion, is perpetual adoration before the blessed is like perpetual. So there was always kind of prayer going on. The militia made their way, 
cut a big hole in the sacristy door and made their way into the church. They found the people at prayer. The leader of the charismatic group that was animating this prayer service paused for a moment, told his friends that were in prayer, we are grateful to God that we, God has brought some of new friends to join us. So let us please continue in prayer. So they continued in prayer. And you can imagine the scene. The militia are there with their weapons and so forth, and they are waiting for them to finish the prayer. They had forgotten that this was perpetual adoration. <laughs> so they got tired of waiting. They went back and said, we shall come back tomorrow. And this happened three times, actually. Came back three times and finding the, the group in perpetual adoration until finally uh, the RPF were able to secure the area and end the genocide. So that is the third miracle that they talk about when they talk about the miracle of Ruhango, that it was really divine providence, not only that healed the priest, not only that provided food, especially at a very, very critical time, but also that prevented uh, us from being uh, massacred uh, by, uh, by, 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 by the, the, the militia. So a sense of miracle, providence. Secondly, is also a sense of family, an old family. A missionary from Poland, Father Ubaniak, a very stubborn priest. His confreres say he was at times difficult to get along with. He was so opinionated, he had his convictions. You know, there are times that stubbornness helps. Uh, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> um, so at the height of the genocide, the UN said all foreign nationals were to be airlifted. They sent a convoy down to Ruhango to take this priest out so that he could be taken back to Poland. Uh, this priest, again stubborn, said, no, 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 I can't go. This is my place. These are my people. I'm not going anywhere. So he stayed. He was among the few expatriates that actually that stayed in Rwanda during the genocide. And out of that, in a way, he was able to gather around him people, um, refugees and so forth, also to protect them. A number of times, actually, the story go, that the militia would come. One time they wanted to come and kill two seminarians people. He came and stood in the middle of them and said, you're not going to do that unless you kill me first. And so he was able to, to save them. So this is the priest that is in charge of this parish. He's not Rwandan. He's Polish. But he has said, these are my people here. He's a Muzungu, if you like. Also with this group, there is a very animated, inspiring preacher, Gerard, who is a Twa. Now remember, the two main tribes in Rwanda, Hutu and Tusi. It's a small, very small minority of the Twa, despised deporters and so forth. Nobody cares about the Twa anywhere. At the heart of the ministry that was going on in Ruhango is Gerard, a very fiery preacher, inspiring preacher, that in a way would mobilize and preach and so forth, and everybody uh, kind of come ar around him. So there is a Muzungu, there is a Twa, and again this community, an odd community, if you like, an odd sense of family, there are all these refugees, beginning with the sick, those who are sick, and all these people who had made their way uh, through the marshes and so forth, refugees. A very strange family, if you like, that is happening here. If Jean Baptiste earlier on had talked about Ruhango as a sense of family, here in Ruhango, you all see, also see this new family. It is an odd family, but it speaks to a kind of a new we. Neither Hutu nor Tusi, neither Rwanda nor Polish, a kind of a mixed up group 
really, but with a strong sense of these are my people. Significantly connected to that sense of these are my people, these seek poor, suffering refuge. A sense of family in a way that begins, that is connected to the marginalized, the poor, the sick, the suffering. So if you want to imagine a sense of old family, a sense of new family, a sense of new belonging, you cannot in a way uh, take it outside the context of who constitutes that sense of new way. A strange sense of family. The third aspect connected to Ruhango is the whole question of healing that is underway. We already talked about the story of Father Stanislas Obaniak, who first of all was healed. And in his being healed at this huge charismatic mass in Kigali, when he was miraculously healed, again, sense of miracle, when he was miraculously healed, he really understood that, oh, he was being healed so that he can do the same, so that he can make his life an opportunity for healing of others. That's why he started this small group in the parish that would have this outreach to the sick and the poor. Connected again with that sense of healing, not only uh, Father Ubaniak, but also similar to what we saw in the story of Father Jean Baptiste, there is a story of another young man who has now also become a priest, Father Anthony, who is connected uh, with Ruhango, but also with the community of Emmanuel. His family was killed during the genocide and was left with so much bitter sense of uh, hatred, woundedness, but also desire for revenge. And this would not let go of him until he found his way to the community of Ruhango and the Emmanuel community that um, uh, animated the community of Ruhango. I caught up with Father Antone, that is his name, and asked him about his experience and why he said, and I quote, that he had found rest when he joined the Emmanuel community. The Emmanuel community, as I will explain later, is not so much like a congregation or a monastic order. It is a spirituality. I asked, what is it about the Emmanuel community that he found uh, therapeutic and healing? And he says, I carried a heavy burden. What is a heavy burden, I pressed him? because I had lost my family in the genocide, and this filled me with not only bitterness, but also with a desire for revenge. What is it that you found with the Emmanuel community that lifted that burden off you, I asked? It is because I found two texts that were at the heart of the spirituality of the Emmanuel community. First of all, the texts of Isaiah. In his wounds will my servant justify many. By his wounds will my servant justify many. Isaiah 53, verse 11. By his suffering, my servant will heal will justify many. And also the text of Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. All you who are burdened, and I will give you rest. And Anthony said, that is exactly what I found when I joined the Emmanuel community. It was the healing of my bitterness and pain but also, and he adds, I saw that actually my being healed could be an opportunity to heal others. There's a strange dynamic going on here. It's healing that is happening to the individual, but as soon as that happens in a way, the individual realizes that this is also an opportunity, an invitation for me 
to heal others. I'm highlighting this because something about the healing that we often feel that is needed in our own lives, yes, it is for us, but there is always that gift, definitely, but it's also connected to a sense of invitation and therefore a sense of mission. This is kind of a very strange uh, dynamic that is going on. But anyway, Anton is talking about his, first of all, his healing, inner healing, and the burden being taken off. But then he goes on, and he says, well, you know, this not only, I did not only carry a heavy burden, the burden of memory, um, for which I found personal healing. And then he surprised me by talking about, well, it's not only us individuals who need healing, we also need healing from, as he describes it, the burden of our history. The burden of our history. Even histories need to be healed. Not only individual healing, but also social healing. And of course I was very much interested, so I pressed him. So what do you mean by the burden of our history? And he talks about the ethnicities in Rwanda. I quote, our identities are limited, he tells me. Being Hutu or Tusi or Rwandan is not enough. First and foremost, I am a child of God. We are all God's children. Our histories need to be healed. And then he continues, without this truth that we are all children of God, our identities can be a burden. I repeat that. Without this truth, our identities can be a burden. Then he describes the history of ethnic hatred in Rwanda and the injustices, the historical injustices that are connected and perpetrated in the name of identity. Our histories need to be healed. We cannot heal our histories by simply trying to forget or denying that it ever happened. Then he continues, we can also not heal by just kind of violently suppressing our history or suppressing all ethnicities. And in this I hear is kind of providing a critique on the official Rwandan government that says you cannot say Hutu or Tusi, you cannot say we are all Rwandans. So if you go to Rwanda and try to kind of evoke those identities, you are in trouble with the government. We are all Rwandans now. I hear in Antone's words a kind of vague critique of that. You cannot just kind of suppress the injustices that have happened. You have, in a way, to heal those. How could our histories be healed? I again pressed him. We can heal our histories by drawing them close. Again, comes to the divine mercy. He says, there is no point, I quote, in hiding who one is. We need to be open and talk about these identities, Hutu and Tusi. That helps us to understand not only our pain, but also the pain of others. It cannot just be simply suppressed, but it needs healing. I feel that he's getting to something very, very deep here. So I ask him, so is the goal then to invite everybody to become a member of the Palatines and Divine Mercy or to become a member of the Emmanuel community? He said, no, 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 no. Emmanuel community is not so much a community as a spirituality, as a way of living. Um, the goal, he says, and I quote, is to accept one another in all our differences and to learn to journey together, to walk together. <clears throat> to journey together toward what, I asked him. And I quote, to journey towards Jesus on the cross, 
to the suffering Jesus whose wounds heal us. This is deep. This is deep. Personal memories need healing. Our histories also need healing. Even our identities need healing. Because without being drawn into another more determinative story, our identities become a burden. That is what he's saying. Identities as a burden. So there is physical healing, there is social healing, there is inner healing, there is the healing of history, but also there is the healing of this thing called identity. So if I ask you, who are you? Who are you? A man? A woman? That's identity? That, if we are to follow Antonin's logic, that also needs to be healed. Who are you? An American? My name's Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe that too needs healing. But there is something I think that is deep that is going on here within this kind of logic that the healing is taking place on these so many, many levels. Uh, let me try to conclude by a few conclusions out of these two stories that I've been telling from these two places of, this is the parish compound in Ruhango where a number of refugees took place and were uh, hiding, and Father Ubaniaksi uh, compound, that's, uh, yeah, so let me uh, conclude by a few, uh, making a, a few con. Uh, conclusion and then we can uh, open up for discussion. The first one is a sense of courage that we talked about in connection, for example, with the resisting violence. Uh, the sense of stubbornness, whether you see it in terms of the students remaining together or whether you see it in terms of, for example, Father, somebody like Father Ubaniak saying, I am staying here, these are my people. It takes a certain amount of courage. Two, the sense of a new family, an odd new family, if you like, we saw in Ruhango and also in Nyange. A new communion that cuts across ethnic, racial, uh, national identity, a strange we, if you like. But if you follow the story of Father Anthony, that new we, really, is a communion a community of love, of the divine mercy. That it is the cross, the suffering God, the suffering Jesus, the cross whose suffering heals, reconciles, and renews our true identity. So kind of, this kind of a communion, a communion that is around the self sacrificing love of God, if you like, that that is what renews, reconciles, and heals our true identity. The third observation and conclusion I want to make is the violence and its many wounds. How violence wounds us on so many levels. On the physical level, um, yes, death, but also like for Jean Baptiste, he was shot in the leg and the, physically, the inner woundedness, the inner healing, the healing of memories on a personal level, on a social level. It's not only individuals, but also our histories that are in a way are connected with violence that need healing, the healing from what Anton describes as the burden of our history, but also the burden of identity. That in all these, there is a certain kind of woundedness in a way that it requires healing. Connected with that, uh, for the observation, connected with that is the depth of that human suffering. That it is really deep, not only on the physical level, on the inner level, the spiritual level, is so much suffering. But what we get from these stories is that the depth of human woundedness can only be healed 
by embracing suffering. Something or oh, something strange here. But of course, that is too much. How can we even embrace suffering? Unless, and this is what I hear going on, unless it is, pre, it is placed, our suffering, under a more determinative story, the story of God's own suffering. Outside such a story, our own woundedness is too much. Outside such a story, our own identities are limited and often enough they become kind of weapons. Identity becomes a weapon, an attempt to protect us from the possibility of suffering and a way of arming ourselves against the other and thus justifying our exclusion of the other even to the extent of killing the other so as to protect ourselves. Unless that is opened up to another story, a more determinative story of the self-sacrificing love of God. A fifth observation I want to make in connection with that, that if you look at it from this point of view, then compassion Compassion in the original sense of compassion, suffering with, becomes the antidote, if you like, to violence. That kind of solidarity that we see in Inyange, that we see in Iruhango, compassion, solidarity, Suffering together, if you like, the solidarity with and outreach to the most vulnerable, including the possibility of risking one's life, like the students in Yange or Father Urbania, that that is the antidote to violence. That is the key, in a way, to resisting violence. And finally, even as we do all that, there is always a bigger story in which we are grounded. That is why, and but he says, we are, we are surprised by the courage. We didn't even know that we had that courage. That's what you hear in Iruhango. This sense of it was really divine providence. It was really a miracle or set of miracles that we are able to do that. So even as we carry on all these different aspects of um, resisting and healing violence in a way, we are grounded within a bigger story that God is doing something big in our lives, beyond us, in which we happen to participate and co constantly being aware that our own lives, that our own identities, that our own histories are part of that big story of what God is doing in the world. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Father Emmanuel, for a um, wonderfully rich lecture. Um, really, really appreciate it. I would, I would like now to introduce our two respondents. Um, our first respondent will, our first response will be from Professor Tade uh, Akedeje. Uh, Tade is associate professor in the Department of Applied Economics, and he holds a joint appointment in the Department of African American and African Studies. His research examines the effects of multiple dimensions of social fragmentation on economic performance in developing countries with an emphasis on sub-Saharan Africa. Immediately following Tade, we're going to have a response from Brooke Chambers, who is a PhD candidate in the University of Minnesota Sociology Department. Ms. Chambers' work focuses on the relationship between memory, reconciliation, commemoration, uh, and commemoration in the wake of mass violence. 
She was a 2018 and 2019 Badzin Fellow in the Holocaust and Genocide Studies and was just recently awarded a prestigious Fulbright Fellowship to continue her fieldwork on generational trauma in Rwanda. So welcome Tade and then welcome Brooke directly after that. Thank you so much, Father uh, Katangale. <laughs> There's so much to unpack. Um, I study uh, ethnicity and economic development. So I, I come to the table with data to explain why we, why we have social fragmentation. Unfortunately, economists, and we are not really good about understanding the historical context we sometimes fall victim to letting the data tell the narrative rather than understanding the narrative and then contextualizing the data uh, within, within the narrative. So this was phenomenal uh, just to uh, listen to you. So as a Christian, the first thing I take from this talk about identity is ultimately our identity is in Christ. Or, or God, if you may. So you, you take the case of Rwanda, where there are two ethnic groups, two dominant ethnic groups, and you had this genocide. I grew up in West Africa, Nigeria, where they have over 200 ethnic groups. And a lot of these ethnicities are colonial constructs. Uh, and so when, when, when you see countries fragment along ethnic lines, it's often, there's often something about a power dynamic uh, going on. But what is unique about Rwanda is it's a Christian country. And so a question I have is what was the role of the church prior to when this genocide occurred. Uh, because when you listen to the stories of uh, connectedness and the healing, th these are, you know, we think of it as ex post. What did it look like ex ante? Then perhaps we have something that I, I, I felt was really, that really impressed me about uh, the narrative of the, uh, of, of, of the, the stories was, perhaps our calling is to serve and not to be served. Because in spite of the pain, the hatred that different, eth the different individuals uh, felt, ultimately they were able to resolve in thinking about the cross or the re what, what, what Christ represents and how he gave his life uh, as an example to us. So that <laughs> is a very, for me, it's very deep because it, it, it draws more out of who am I and why am I here? And am I doing what I am called to do? And how is my life an example to others? Uh, otherwise, we tend to forget our identity, and we may run the risk of, it, it's, it's a slow, it's a, you know, we slide off that, the rails in a way where uh, we may not even realize it. So the three examples, sense of family, uh, sense of community, the, the kindred spirits of sorts, uh, sense of providence and seeing healing, things that, things that we really can't, in our limited understanding, explain. And we have to really think of it in a, in a more divine 
realm. Because once we can explain, well, I feel like if I can explain something, there's nothing novel about it. I mean, it's like, oh, wow, you know, I figured this out. But it's when I can't really explain something that it, it draws me to, well, I'm very limited in what I know. There's a lot I don't know. And there are things that are happening that we may say, well, it's by accident. Well, um, as a Christian, I don't think of things as happening to me by accident. Something divine about what has happened. And the, the, I think what really touched me was the issue of healing. Because I think it cuts, it, that's about humanity. It's beyond Rwanda, it's everywhere where there is pain or atrocities that, that we may witness, see, experience, and the, how powerful this, this sense of healing can be for the human race. Uh, Rwanda may be an example, but for the human race in, in general. So I'll, I'll, I have just one very, very quick question. So, Today in Rwanda, you cannot talk about, uh, as, as Father Katongale said, you, you can't talk about a Hutu or a Tutsi, ex, you know. So to what extent does, has the church uh, participate in maybe a sense of trying to, 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 is it reform, reshape, or I don't want to say change the identity, but create a more inclusive us uh, and not this and that, or us and them, but more of an us uh, society. So I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again for the kind invitation to speak this evening. Um, I'm truly honored to have the chance to respond to Father Emmanuel's words. Um, over the past few years, I've been lucky enough to be a part of a number of research projects that speak to themes that Father Emmanuel um, discussed this evening. So in Rwanda, I've spoken with judges and witnesses in the Gachacha courts which sought to address post-genocide reconciliation at the local level. Um, I've also interviewed genocide perpetrators about their process of reconciling with their communities upon returning home from incarceration. Um, but my own dissertation work, as Travis mentioned, um, and the area which I would love to provide some additional thoughts tonight, speaks to the impacts of genocidal violence as well as the post-violence process of reconciliation um, in the long term. So specifically, I study generational trauma and the ways in which violence continues to impact young Rwandans born in the aftermath of the genocide. So with that as a bit of context, um, I'd love to share a few thoughts as to how my own discipline of sociology and research, my own research, intersects with Father Emmanuel's work. Um, so as a discipline, sociology prioritizes conversations of power. Um, Father Emmanuel and Tari as well um, dissected this legacy of power um, in shaping ethnic identity in Rwanda. And I think these disruptions of more naturalistic understandings of violence and identity are truly essential. Um, so Father Emmanuel discussed how power has historically shaped identity, um, and this idea kind of speaks back against these concepts of violence in the global south as um, timeless or primordial or tribal warfare. Um, and these unfitting descriptions are still pretty prominent, so I think that's always important. Um, and in doing this, Father Emmanuel charted the complexity of identity and violence and resistance and belonging. Um, and this perspective provides a foundation upon which we can better appreciate actors in spaces of violence and post-violence as potential agents for constructive change. So from my own disciplinary lens, um, these themes are also very prominent within the social science literature. Um, and as social scientists, we are definitely trained to see the world through a very critical lens. Um, we investigate these legacies of violence and how they shape society today. 
Um, this can often, for better or worse, result in a fairly pessimistic view of the state of things. Um, so what I really appreciated about Father Emmanuel's commentary was his proposal of solutions and his emphasis on hope. Um, with, again, these complex conceptualizations of identity and of violence, he prioritizes discussion of resistance and agency during genocide. And in the aftermath of violence, he sets this conceptual foundation um, with space for actors to promote reconciliation and unity. And I've met many young Rwandans who've expressed similar sentiments when sharing their journeys, um, both in faith and in reconciliation. So one young woman I interviewed um, explained to me how her journey as a Christian was deeply intertwined with her journey in making sense of the genocide. In reflecting on her own trauma and the trauma of her community, she told me um, that God felt the pain of the genocide even more deeply than Rwandans. She said that God's heart was breaking during the violence, but that he loves, um, he loves enough to give humans the capacity of free will. And I bring up this story to illustrate how this reinvention of identity through faith expands beyond those who experience the genocide directly, and that the youth of Rwanda continue to grapple with these questions as well. Like Father Emmanuel's comments about those who experienced the genocide, the reinvention of identity for, one, for Rwandans born after the violence is often toned by both tragedy and by hope. The trauma of violence has marred the trajectory of so many young adults. But as I first began conducting interviews, I found myself surprised at how often our conversations turn to themes of hope. Interspersed in our discussion of memory and loss are the goals, joys, and desires that young Rwandans hold for the future. While violence and trauma are always at the fore, we so often turn to discussions of hope for happy lives and for prolonged and sustainable peace. As one woman expressed, what we're looking for is a better country, a better life, and a better future. And Father Emmanuel's words this evening echoed that hope. So to conclude, I also have a few questions to pose. Um, as a general theme, Father Emmanuel, I would love to hear your thoughts um, on how your discussion of reconciliation, especially these ideas of healing and belonging, um, speak to the generations of Rwandans to come. So perhaps more specifically, um, how do you see these ideas of this new we impacting young Rwandans who are seeking to make sense of the world in the aftermath of genocide? Um, or more holistically, um, who is responsible for the cultivation of belonging and healing? And what is the role of this next generation in seeking unity in the aftermath of violence? Thank you again. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, um, Tade. You can come on up, um, Father Emmanuel. Um, I'm now going to give the mic over to Father Emmanuel uh, to uh, respond to any questions that he sees fit. And then do you want to um, call on people for the Q&A? Do you feel comfortable doing that after you're done responding? Sure. Okay. So after... Um, after he's responded to uh, Brooke and Tade, we're going to have uh, a brief time of uh, question and answer. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and um, wait to be answered on. Uh, bear in mind that a good question will have three defining features. It will be brief, it will be civil, and it will be in the form of a question. And tonight, we're adding a fourth feature because we only have one microphone. So it will also be loud. Um, please speak in such a way that you can be heard all throughout the room uh, to the best of your abilities. And um, I'll allow Father Emmanuel to, to do the time of Q&A on, on his own. And then I will watch the clock and let us know when we've run out of time. So back to you. Thank you, Travis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brooke, and thank you today for uh, taking the time to uh, read uh, the chapter and for the very uh, helpful uh, uh, extensions and feedback and as well as questions. I don't have, uh, yeah, let me just say kind of just say two uh, quick comments on each one of these uh, questions. Uh, beginning with the uh, question posed by Brooke about uh, young Rwandans. You've been to Rwanda a number of times, uh, and some of you also have been to Rwanda. One thing that worries me about Rwanda, 
It's incredible economic development in Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda's Kagame, as a president, Kagame's vision um, 2040 is to transform Rwanda into a Singapore of Africa. Uh, and things work in Rwanda. Um, I have argued uh, that Rwanda perhaps is the only nation state that works in Africa. Things are efficient. And somebody who lived in Europe in Belgium, the former colonial masters of Rwanda, I can see the mirror image of Belgium uh, in Rwanda. The Belgians have, for example, bureaucracy and stamps and so forth. Rwanda, you can have, I don't know how many stamps every, uh, at every place. It's because Rwanda is a very efficient, well-organized society also. It's because of that that the genocide succeeded. Uh, I, I, I don't think the genocide could succeed in any other African country with the same efficiency that it did succeed in Rwanda. Now, when the current government gives itself to reconstruction, they do it in a very efficient, effective, zero corruption way, where everybody is known where they are at any given particular time. It's, it's, that is what also worries me about Rwanda. This kind of hyper uh, self-consciousness about we are Rwandans. They are no more identities, but we are Rwandans. I don't find that salvific person, maybe because I'm a Christian, but also because I know that soon or later victims become killers. Uh, you see it in the story of Israel, Palestine, genocide, surviving genocide become a, a pretext for violence. This is what I was getting to in terms of identities become a way of arming ourselves and therefore uh, excluding the other, dismissing the other, subjugating the other because we are afraid that it's going to destroy our own identities. I see it in Rwanda, that kind of hyper, uh, I, we are all Rwandans. What Rwanda's, for example, uh, involvement in the Congo uh, means and so forth. And so many of these, young Rwandans that you ask me, what would I propose? I say, it becomes too intense. I like Father Anthony, our identities are limited. And unless they find healing, being drawn into something bigger, something more salvific, uh, something more truthful. And for Anthony, Jean Baptiste, that is in a way connected to God's own suffering. Not God's own preservation of God's own identity. But it's God's own going out to humanity, including his willingness to die on the cross. Now, that is a truth that saves. That is a truth that saves identity, that saves us, that heals us, that reconciles us. So in other words, we are reconciled around the cross around this difficult idea to comprehend that this all-powerful God would die on the cross. That there's something about God's self-sacrificing love in a way that heals, that reconciles, but also that is the truth of our lives. To the extent that our identities, whether being Rwandan, being Hutu, being Tusi, being American, being a man, being uh, gay, being whatever identity, it becomes limited and becomes then a burden. That's what I think Anton is getting to. And that's what worries me about uh, some of that kind of hyper identity uh, politics in Rwanda. It's refused to say we are Hutu Tusi, that means according to Anthony, refusing to accept the historical injustices and so forth, but then kind of replacing that we are Rwandans. I don't find that any more salvific, personally. Uh, but that's where, again, to come to Atale's question about the church. My hope is that the church can become a space where you can see a little bit of that, not just a little bit, you can see something of this self-sacrificing love, bringing Hutu, Tusi, Rwandans, Congolese, uh, different, in a way, identities together. And for that to happen in a way, the church has to live more fully into the story it claims is at the heart of its gospel, the self-sacrificing love of God. 
And to the extent that the church often forgets that in view of protecting its own institutional survival, then it lives into a different story. And this is the whole story of the colonialism in Rwanda, the church and state kind of working closely together, but the church in a way kind of just telling the story of the colonialist, of nation state building and so forth and so on, anthropology becoming the key rather than a kind of theology for, 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 for the church. So when anthropology, the anthropology of the day, named Rwandans that all their distinct races, the Hutu and Tusa are so distinct, uh, they come from different origins and so forth. The church simply accepted that and perpetuated it and taught it in schools as the gospel in a way. And so that kind of close connection, alliance between church and state in a way, I don't think has done Christianity well in Rwanda. Uh, and so I think it's connected. My hope is that you can find spaces, and maybe some of the stories we are telling this evening, like Rohango, there can be spaces in which not only uh, the physical healing is taking place, the inner healing is taking place, but the kind of the healing of identity that Anton is talking about is, is taking place. Uh, for that to happen, I think the church also has, in a way, to unlearn a number of patterns, a number of habits connected to its uh, legacy and colonial, colonial history in Rwanda. Uh, well, let me also just say one, one, one thing that you mentioned about, about, about hope, because it's so important. I think that's something about, 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 about hope. I think Christian life is about hope. I feel the exhortation that uh, Peter, in the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 3, verse 15, puts before us, Christian, always be willing to give an account of hope, the hope that is in you. I think it's the task that we are called uh, upon. And, and so that's why I kind of, I'm interested in these kind of stories to the extent to which they radiate the hope that all of us <laughs> are, are called to. But these kind of stories, whether it is Jean Baptiste or Father uh, Ubania, they radiate that and so forth. And so in doing that, I think they not only uh, show where we are called, but hopefully they also inspire us. If we don't have stories of hope, our uh, fate is terrible. Because we're going to live with the stories of hatred, of violence, and, uh, and you know how bad news, in a way, uh, spreads. I think what I'm trying to do in terms of kind of providing stories as a lens is an invitation that, yeah, let's, let's not be afraid to tell one another this kind of stories. Like in your research in Rwanda, what are the stories that you have found helpful that kind of radiate hope and, yeah. Uh, I guess I'm just kind of highlighting that because I find it so helpful. Whether one is doing economics, whether one is doing uh, sociology, I think so a similar invitation into which we are called. Anyway, the floor is open uh, for questions, for comments, uh, observations. Father Daniel? Yes. Yes, you've read a lot about lament. Can you connect lament with healing in this story? Can you say something about that? Yes. Uh, I, I thought I began with the, the slide on... Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, this church in... Uh, it's not in Yamata, it's actually in Nyange. That's the church that was erased. Over uh, a number of years, I've been leading these, uh, what I call pilgrimages of pain and hope of groups of people to Uganda and Rwanda, and these kind of very different places. But here, especially at uh, Nyange, this church that was erased with the conspiracy of, of the priest, I have never felt perhaps as much lament as standing on this ground. When, all of a sudden, the first time I stood there, all of a sudden, uh, I realized, I didn't realize that first, I realized that actually I was standing on slabs of grave, graves, and that's when uh, the person was telling us the story that underneath were the remains of over 2,000 people that were buried 
in this church. So as a Christian, as a Catholic priest, uh, standing on that ground, that's where I felt an, in, an, an, immense, an immense kind of experience of, of, of lament. And that kind of actually led me to see that there is no way that one can even begin the journey of healing without that deep sense of lament. It was so funny because as soon as we finished there, we, we went to the parish compound, and then the priest there, he was talking about all oh, the plans to rebuild the church and so forth. And all of us were still shocked and crying about this event and said, well, we have this plan. So he was bringing out the beautiful plans of the new church, and he was talking about uh, the baptism that are going on. And what did I tell him? Stop. Wait, wait, wait a minute. So then we were asking him, about, so what happened in 1994? He said, well, I was not here. I came after that and so forth. So that's kind of, I said, no, I, I don't think that, that can do. I think it has to really be grounded in that deep sense of, of lament, uh, of realizing that something is deeply, deeply broken, of that kind of pain. It's the same lament I felt going to the school in, in, in Nyange, um, where these eight students who were, were killed, and behind there, there is a grave of two students, uh, the gravesite of two students that we are buried there, that deep sense of, of pain. And so for me to tease this story of Jean Baptiste as a story of hope, but it is so much caught up also in lament. Recently, actually last week, talking to Jean Baptiste, he was at Notre Dame, I asked him about his ministry. And he said, you know, there are many times that I don't like what I'm doing because it is so painful listening to all these people with so much of these stories of pain. So I, then I ask him, so what keeps you going? It's just the sense that people actually at times at the end of the week and so forth, so they feel like released. They feel unburdened. That, that sense of that you have in a way uh, unbound somebody, that you have helped them to kind of, to come to a new sense of who they are. That's what, but, so in, in other words, the pain never really goes away completely, even that kind of healing. There is, there is, there is always that. But that has been subsumed, if you like, into a more positive, not positive, a more hopeful story. So what I want to, to say is that, let's not think about lament as just a stage that, okay, you go through lament, and then you come to the sunny side of hope. The book that I've written, for example, Born of Lament, uh, shows the, the research that I'm doing, that actually lament is that kind of ongoing agency, if you like, way of living in the midst of violence, in the midst of challenges and so forth, without giving way <laughs> to despair and how lament and hope go hand in hand. Like Augustine says, they are kind of twin daughters. They go hand in hand. But then to the extent that we try to avoid, in a way, standing on those grounds of pain uh, and embracing lament, that means, according to Brueggemann, that we don't really live in hope. We live in optimism that things are going to be better. But real, the real experience of hope is so, in a way, caught up uh, with also a sense of fragility, of suffering. I think this is exactly what these stories are pointing to in terms of it's an invitation toward what? Towards the cross, the self-sacrificing love of God. That is painful. We want to move to something, but, but concretely that means that unless we learn to embrace suffering, unless we learn to embrace pain in our lives, we just kind of transmit it to others. We just kind of transfer it uh, as a way to kind of protect uh, ourselves from that. And yet that is the truth of our lives. That's, that's what I find powerful about this, that they are naming the truth of our lives, that it's a very difficult truth in a way, but it's about really learning to embrace suffering. Uh, and I think Christianity, what I find hopeful about Christianity, about God, about Jesus that I've come to know is that his willingness to embrace this moment of suffering and showing that actually life and death, suffering, resurrection, go hand in hand. 
is what I find incredible, unique about, 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 about this. Not as kind of a denial of suffering. Most of the time, these kind of identities are built on that kind of denial. God forbid that we suffer, but you can suffer. You, 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 can, you can be killed, but no. That is really an attempt to kind of deny the basic fact about our lives. The, the earlier and the, that we embrace that fact that we are simple, vulnerable, fragile creatures bound to death, that we are dying every day, the earlier we accept that, the more I think we live at peace with who we are, created in God's image, yes, but if you are created in God's image, what we see in God is going to the cross as well. But at the same time, beautiful creatures are that. That's what makes us as creatures both beautiful, but also constantly fragile. But that, that is the fact of our lives. So I, I find that these kind of stories are kind of drawing us to that simple fact that we tend to deny or forget in terms of trying to protect ourselves and our community and uh, our identities from any of these vicissitudes to, uh, to, to change, to, uh, to pain, to suffering, and, and to death. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Father Emmanuel, for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, you talked a lot about identity. I was curious if you have any thoughts to share on how Americans deal with identities and how we might be able to do that better as Christians. Wow. Well, that's a that's a deep question. How do Americans? I should ask you how do Americans deal with the issues of identity and how 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 can you do better about that? I just can maybe say one thing that always struck me about uh, how the American identity is so strong. Uh, even when people describe themselves. I am an American Christian. The emphasis is always American. <laughs> I am an American whatever. So a very, very strong identity. Uh, similar to what I think Kagame is trying to kind of project for Rwanda, we are Rwandans first, and everything else is an add-on. Uh, that is precisely why I wrote the book, Mirror to the Church, that Rwanda in a way reflects some of these kind of identity formations in a way in which kind of Christianity just becomes an add-on that doesn't radically question uh, who we are, whether as ethnicities, Hutu-Tusi, Rwandan, whatever, or nationalities. And in that book, Mirror to the Church, I made a claim to the effect that the mission of the church is not to make America more Christian. The mission of the church is not to make Rwanda more Christian. The mission of the church is to make America, American Christians, less American. Uh, <laughs> and, to, and, and to make Rwandan Christians less Rwandan. <laughs> so that together we may experience something of a bit of what it means to be that new we, that God's children. Uh, but I think most of the time we think that, oh, yeah, the, the church is here to make American more Christian. I, I don't think that's, uh, I think it's to make it, and that, that makes that Christianity becomes, in a way, a suspect becomes a, a dangerous factor if you, <laughs> you really mix it with the, uh, the sense of that kind of strong saying, we are Americans. And, but also that kind of sense of identity. Maybe it's, it's, it's my own sense of somebody who has lived so, through so many fragments of identities and each one trying to claim me. As they have introduced, my parents migrated from Rwanda and born in Uganda. When I introduce myself, people say, oh, but you are really, really Rwandan. I said, what makes me really, really Rwandan? I, I don't know you Rwanda. I was born and raised in Uganda. Oh, but by your, your parents, but, yeah. But my parents migrated originally from above, from heaven. So I should really, really be. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of a sense of strong. I, I have always found myself, I think, between maybe this is just kind of reflecting my own sense of, uh, yeah, not, not being at home with any one particular identity. But I think it was also a journey that has helped me to see how all these identities, in a way, are fragments. And, but each fragment, and I get this from 
Alexander Schmemann, uh, who said, each fragment doesn't even know that it's a fragment. It thinks that it is the whole, and violently tries to exclude all the other fragments and so forth. <laughs> so when you're Rwandan, you think, oh, it's so important to be Rwandan, and you can only be Rwandan, or you can only be Hutu or Tutsi, or you can only be American and not whatever that not is and so forth. But I think in the bigger picture of things, these are all fragments in a way. We happen to be born somewhere. Of course we are always born somewhere. We begin somewhere, but that's not destiny. That is the starting point of a journey. A journey toward what? A journey toward that new way that Anton is talking about. So identities, I don't, I'm not denying that they're identities. They are identities, but that's not destiny. That's the starting point of our journey, our journey to something that in a way brings together, reconciles, and all kind of creates something new. Similar to what I talk, uh, just shared about this coming of Ruhango, who's a Polish priest, who is calling these my people, there is a Twa, uh, there is Hutu, there are Tusis, and so forth. That kind of odd sense of, for me, that is church, if you're asking about church. Thank you.